My name is Jeff Frenzel. Uh, as I said before, I'm Yale's Dean of Undergraduate Admissions and Master of Timothy Dwight College. As Master of the College, it is my honor and privilege to serve as the current steward of the Chubb Fellowship at Yale and to welcome you to this extraordinary Chubb event. For over 60 years, the generous gift of Yale alumnus Hendon Chubb has made it possible for the Master and Fellows of Timothy Dwight College to bring to Yale's campus an astonishing range of local, state, national, and world leaders in public affairs, industry, and the arts. In a moment, I will ask President Levin to introduce to you today's remarkable speaker. Before that, let me just provide a few simple instructions. For those who were already in the hall a bit earlier, uh, you've helped us assemble some questions for Dao Su, and President Levin will relay those questions to her after her prepared remarks. Second, we ask you not to turn on or to use or to take out cell phones, computers, or personal cameras when Dao Su comes onto the stage or during the presentation. Uh, this is both out of respect and politeness and also uh, for security reasons. Uh, the event is being broadcast live on the internet. It's being simulcast on the campus, and it will be archived for later viewing uh, on both the Yale and the Chubb Fellowship websites. We will also post photographs uh, of the event for sharing uh, with your friends and colleagues. Third, following the conclusion of the program, please remain seated briefly while Dao Su and her delegation leave the stage and the hall. Thanks for your help with these matters. Now please welcome President Richard C. Levin and Dal Aung San Suu Kyi. Good morning, everyone. I speak for the entire university when I say that it is a deep honor and a very sincere pleasure to welcome Da Aung San Suu Kyi, Chair of the National League of Democracy in Burma, a member of parliament, uh, to Yale. It is just a very special privilege for us to have you with us. I believe that everyone in this audience knows the basic outline of Da Su's extraordinary story. The daughter of Aung San, who liberated Burma from colonial rule before being cruelly assassinated in 1947. She spent many years outside Burma being educated at Oxford and raising a family there. When her mother became very ill, she returned to Burma in 1988, only to find that a student uprising was restoring some sense of hope to the millions of Burmese under oppressive military rule. She quickly became the leader of the movement for democracy, assuming the mantle with humility, bravery, and courage. She famously defied soldiers whose loaded guns were aimed directly at her, inspiring the U2 song, Walk On. She was placed under house arrest soon thereafter and spent more than 15 of the next 20 years in isolation. Released from house arrest in November 2010 and elected to parliament in April of this year, she has continued her crusade for the rights of the Burmese people. Thanks to Dasu's courage and the inspiration she has provided to the people of Burma, the prospects for the restoration of democracy are greater now than they have been for decades. Since her release from house arrest, Dasu has partnered with Burma's new civilian government to help lead a period of rapid, rapid political and economic liberalization. The government has released hundreds of political prisoners and granted substantial freedom to the press. The United States and many other nations have reciprocated these actions by easing sanctions and pledging foreign aid. But because a democratic future is not fully assured, Dasu's work is not yet done. Dasu was honored with the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991 and with a Congressional Gold Medal last week. 
Jane and I had the privilege of hearing her last speak last Friday when she received the Global Citizen Award from the Atlantic Council. As you will see momentarily, she is a true inspiration. In a beautiful essay that Dosu wrote in 1990, entitled Freedom from Fear, she claimed that Nehru, Nehru's words describing Mahatma Gandhi could be applied to her father, Aung San. I would suggest that they apply equally well to her, and I paraphrase here to get the gender right. The essence of her teaching is fearlessness and truth, and action allied to these, always keeping the welfare of the masses in view. As she herself has said about the poetry that she reveres and from which she takes strength, Dasu is, and I quote, a great unifier that knows no frontiers of space or time. Today, I'm pleased to announce that Yale is taking several small steps to facilitate the reforms underway in Burma. First, we are stepping up our admissions recruitment efforts for students from Burma, and we will be communicating more broadly the fact, little known there, that the parents of applicants to Yale College who make less than $65,000 a year are not required to make a contribution to their child's tuition. Second, we will work to implement an idea discussed yesterday with Dasu to bring high school teachers and principals to Yale to encourage them to raise the sights of their students to advise them and to advise them on the generous financial aid programs available at Yale and elsewhere in the United States. And finally, I'm particularly pleased to announce that with the cooperation of the Council on Southeast Asian Studies at Yale, we will support the establishment of a successor publication to the Journal of the Burma Research Society, a prominent vehicle for scholarly publication on Burma before it was shut down by the military regime in the 1970s. <clears throat> As uh, Dean Brenzel mentioned to you, the Chubb Fellowship is among the highest honors accorded to a visitor at Yale. Since 1949, Chubb Fellows have included former presidents of the United States, numerous heads of state, and prominent figures from government, industry, and the arts. Today's Chubb Fellow adds luster to that luminous list. Please join me in welcoming Wang San Su Chi. Thank you. Thank you for your very warm welcome. The subject on which I'm going to speak today is rule of law. Not rule of law as you might be taught in your classrooms, that your professors can do far more com competently than I could ever hope to. But rule of law as I see it, and others like me in Burma see it, and why rule of law is important to us. To begin with, I had a very healthy minimum contact with the law until 1988. <laughs> Up till 1988, the only two contacts, shall we say, I had had with the law were as a student at Oxford. Once, I was cycling the wrong way down a one-way street <laughs> and ran straight into a police patrol car. Uh, the policeman put out his head and looked at me and asked me if I knew that that was a one-way street. I said yes. And so he proceeded on his way, and I hopped off my bike and proceeded on mine. The second time also was at Oxford, when at an hour just before dusk, when the roads were empty, I cycled absent-mindedly through a red light. And the roads were empty, but for a patrol car, which was right behind me. <laughs> so I should have known then that my contacts with the security forces were going to be unique in future. <laughs> The real contact came in 1988-89, when I was first placed under house arrest. This was on the 20th July, 1989, and uh, suddenly hordes of uh, policemen and uniformed soldiers 
came into my compound and uh, rounded up everybody there. I was kept in the house. I thought they were going to take, away, take me away to prison as well, but they left me in the house under house arrest and took the others away to prison. They had brought a detention order and they read it out. This order said that um, act, they, were, they were placing me under house arrest in accordance with uh, the law meant to, now how did they put it, uh, to protect the state against destructive elements. I was a destructive element. So this meant that I could be placed under house arrest without trial. Now this is section 10. Uh, section 10 is, has two parts to it, 10A and 10B. 10A means imprisonment without trial. 10B is house arrest without trial. I was placed under house arrest under 10B. According to that law, uh, the detention order would have to be renewed every six months and was renewable for a total period of three years. And the decision as to whether or not they would renew the detention order would be made by what they call uh, the, the, the Central Committee of Ministers. This is a small group of three or four ministers, including the whole minister. At that time, I had had so very little to do with such matters that I had assumed that they had placed me under house arrest because this was in accordance with the law. They, I was alone in the house. My two sons were with me for a short while, but uh, then they left to go back to England. But they kept me in the house and the security forces took up their residence in my compound. I thought also then that this was what they were entitled to do. It was only years later I learned that they were not entitled to take up res residence within my compound. So this was the beginning of the time when I realized how very little I knew about the laws of the land and how very little I knew about whether or not these laws were respected. I was allowed a shortwave radio, which kept me in touch with the outside world, and I learned from this radio that more and more of the members of my party were being arrested. And most often, they were arrested under Section 5. Section 5 is the law that was brought out in 1950 to cope with the, what they call the emergency, um, emergency situation of that time, because there were many insurgencies then. And in, under Section 5, we used to, the, later we politicians, politicians used to refer to it as a um, I can't bear you law. Anybody that they didn't like, they could grab under Section 5 and put them away for a period of up to five years, but they would slap other uh, charges against these people and could keep them up to 20 years, which they have done. I think our longest... Uh, uh, the, the member of a party who served the longest single period in jail stayed there for 18 years and three months, although he was originally supposed to have been imprisoned only for about five years. So my own experiences made me understand that there was no rule of law in Burma. The law was used by those in authority for their own ends. The law was not there to protect the people of the country. Section 5, Section 10, and then there were other sections which we, I became very familiar with. Section 17, which was to do with association with the unlawful organizations. These were the sections used by the military regime to put the members of the NLD in prison at any time they felt like it, and to keep them for as long as they wished. Section 10 was amended when, they, when the time came near for my release, three years after I had first been placed under house arrest. They changed it so that they could keep me in for more than that. And in fact, they kept me in for six years. Have you ever heard of a law being changed simply to keep one person longer in prison? This shows you what it meant not to be under the rule of law. While I was in 
under house arrest and listening to the, the news of the arrest of, my, arrest, arrest of so many of my colleagues, I decided that we needed a legal aid committee. We didn't have any such thing in our country. I don't think it had ever been known. So the moment I was released after my first term of house arrest in 1995, uh, I explained to our party that we must have a legal aid committee. The person I chose to head this committee was then the chairman of our NLD, Utenu, who used to be the commander in chief of the Burmese army, and he was a trained uh, lawyer. He took up law after he was expelled from the, the army. I asked him to form this legal aid committee to protect those of our colleagues who were charged for, uh, under some section or the other, but all these sections were just an excuse for putting them away, for ke keeping them out of active politics. And when I put the suggestion to Utenu, he was not, he, he, was, he was a very, well, he still is uh, a really good professional soldier. He obeys orders in a very straightforward manner. And he always looked upon me as, as what he used to call his commander. So when I said, please, would you head the legal aid committee? He said, yes. But months later, he told me that he didn't believe in it. He said yes, and he took on this job because I had asked him to. He did not believe that it would do any good because, he said, we would never have won any case when we were trying to defend our colleagues who had been charged with uh, charged under Section 5 or 10 or any of those other uh, very questionable sections. But I explained to him that I knew we would probably not be able to win the freedom of our colleagues once they had been arrested. But first of all, I wanted our people to be, to be confident that they would not be abandoned, that they would be defended as far as possible in accordance with the laws of the land. And secondly, I said that all these cases would remain on record, and that was necessary for the future. These cases of lack of rule of law would be there forever on record for future generations to see what they should avoid. He accepted my explanation, but and he, sh he showed no indication whatsoever that he didn't really think it, was, uh, it, 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 it w would have any positive results. But later, he admitted that he was wrong. The heart that we put into our colleagues, they all knew that they would probably not get away with it, that we would not be able to uh, re uh, obtain the release. But they were happy that somebody was there to stand up in court to defend them, which had not been the case before we found the Legal Aid Committee. A few of our brave lawyers had come forward to defend prisoners of conscience, to those charged under those various sections. But we had never won a case, and we didn't win any cases. Of the thousands of cases that were taken up by our Legal Aid Committee, we won only one, one single case, and the judge was a woman. I don't know whether this has any significance. But I must also add that after she had uh, passed judgment, freeing our prisoner, she was sent off to a remote provi provincial town as a punishment for daring to do justice by us. So we learned as we went along that without rule of law, our people were never going to be free from fear. They would always be afraid that even if they had done nothing wrong, action could be taken against them in accordance with the so-called laws of the land. So the importance of rule of law was made known to us through our daily experience. Many of our people in those days were arrested for such small matters as the distribution of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was considered very dangerous. The NLD was trying to let our people know what their rights were, because Burma was a signatory of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in fact, at that time, the military regime had come to an agreement uh, with the United Nations to disseminate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as widely as possible. 
So what we were doing was in accordance with what the military government had undertaken to do. And yet, some of our people were arrested simply for distributing copies of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So for us, human rights and rule of law went together. It says in the preamble to the United Nations Declaration that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. And we believe that this is absolutely essential. Unless there is rule of law, there can be no guarantee of human rights. So when the NLD decided to contest the by-elections last April, we put forward as the main plank of our election platform rule of law. There are three main planks, rule of law, an end to ethnic conflict, and amendments to the Constitution. Some have questioned whether it was right to put rule of law before end to ethnic conflict. We did that because we think that, practically speaking, we cannot bring an end to ethnic conflict unless there is rule of law, unless we can assure our ethnic nationalities that justice will not only be done, but seen to be done for them. They would not be able to support any peace process with full confidence. So we think rule of law is the first step towards a genuine democratic society in Burma. And because of what we have suffered, we knew from experience that rule of law is what rules our lives from day to day. And if it is rule of unjust laws, then we are ruled unjustly from day to day. These sections that I have mentioned earlier, sections 10 and 5, should, have, should never have been practiced. They should, we want these to be removed completely from the body of our law. But this has not yet been possible. We are trying to, we, 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 we are trying very hard within the legislature, but I have to remind everybody that we are a very small minority as yet to remove these laws which are misused by the authorities to deprive the, the people of their basic rights. You can charge anybody with those sections. Um, when you say that somebody is a destructive element, what exactly does it mean? How do you prove whether or not I'm a destructive element? But the authorities decided that I was a destructive element, I was a danger to the peace and tranquility of the state, and therefore I could be put away for years and years. The first time was six years, and then about two years, and then the last time, again, uh, six years. So I was, of course, much better off under house arrest than my colleagues in prison. But the section under which they were placed in prison, section five, is equally destructive of basic human rights. Because there is, uh, section five has a very uh, peculiar part to it, that if you act in such a way as to diminish the love of the people for the government, that, then you can be charged under section five. Now, how do you decide whether or not you have done anything to diminish somebody's love from something else? It's so vague and it's so broad, you can just pull anybody in. This is why we decided that we would run for our by-elections on this platform, putting rule of law at the very head. And after uh, we contested the by-elections and we did well. We won 43 out of the 44 seats that we contested. We entered the parliament, uh, the National Assembly. And since I've been in the National Assembly, the speaker has made me chairman of the Committee for Rule of Law and Tranquility. I know you will laugh. Everybody smiles when I say rule of law and tranquility. But uh, it's a nice thought. <laughs> As, uh, as a practical step towards re-establishing rule of law in the country, we organized 
a seminar with uh, retired judges and experienced lawyers to find out what we could do to restore rule of law in Burma. I say restore because once upon a time, we did have rule of law in Burma. And uh, some of the old lawyers spoke, the old judges spoke, and uh, one of them talked about the independence of the judiciary, which we had enjoyed after, after we became an independent uh, nation. We were a parliamentary democracy, and the judiciary exercised considerable independence. I think if you want to uh, read about the early history of the judiciary in Burma, uh, you'll have to read Dr. Mama, who was at Yale's Law School as a Ford Foundation scholar for a couple of years before the first military coup. He later became, for briefly, uh, the president of Burma after the uprising in 1988, but uh, he did not stay in his post very long. In this study, he will, you, you will find that we did have considerable independence of the judiciary. But with the military takeover, this independence was also destroyed. Our old judges and lawyers wanted us to reestablish the independence of the judiciary. And that, of course, is of primary importance. Because under the military regime, the judiciary was totally under orders from the executive. At the trial of political activists, the judges quite openly would wait for a small envelope to, put, to be put in front of them. They would open it, and in that envelope would be the sentence that they were expected to pass on uh, the, the prisoner's charge. And they would pass sentence. We try to teach the members of our party to, to ask those who came to arrest them what the charges were and whether they, or not they had a warrant. And one of our members did just that when a troop of security officers came to arrest him. He said, do you have a warrant and what are the charges? And the man said, don't be ridiculous. We've already decided what your sentence is going to be. <laughs> so this is rule of law in Burma. And he thought it was perfectly all right for him to do this. And he was simply uh, trying to let our our man know that he should not engage in such stupid activities as trying to get the, get the law to work for him. The law only worked for those in power. That was what rule of law, lack of rule of law meant for us. The law only worked for those who were in power, for those who were in authority. It was not there to protect the people or to protect our democratic rights. But of course, the military regime did not believe in democratic rights. But now, as the chairman of the Committee for Rule of Law, we have to work in a practical way to re-establish an independent judiciary which has the confidence of the people. Our people no longer believe in the judiciary. Democracy requires a balance between the three branches of the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. We have hardly a judicial branch to speak of because it had been so crushed under the executive for so many years. Some of our advisors in that seminar suggested the best way in which we could re-establish an independent and respectable judiciary would, we, would be to educate people who would be uh, to be judges. They said, uh, one, one of the old lawyers said, the reason why we did not have rule of law in Burma now was because we no longer had judges who were well trained in the law and well trained in the practices of justice. This is why, he said, there is so much corruption in the courts of Burma. And simply by producing educated ju judges, we would be able to remedy the situation. I think this is too simplistic. It is not that easy to change the ways of people who have become corrupt over the years. Judges who have become corrupt cannot be changed simply by sending them to special courses at Yale. They may, <laughs> they may in fact learn. <laughs> so it's, it's, 
not just a question of acquiring a good education. It's a question of uh, attitudes, of mindset. Over the years, not just our judges, but our civil servants in general have become very corrupt. They became corrupt to begin with because their salaries were inadequate. And in order to uh, make sure that they would be able to leave, lead decent lives and educate their children, they started uh, asking for bribes and getting them. Now, people who get used to that way of life cannot go back to the old, clean ways easily. A civil servant with a decent salary in Burma in the old days could live a respectful life. He would have a house, he would have a car, his children will be, would be able to go to good schools, and he would be respected by the community in which he lived. And that was enough for civil servants then. But during the years of corruption, civil servants, some civil servants became very wealthy. They would have several houses, several cars, their children would enjoy all kinds of privileges. And to expect those people to go back to the old ways would be difficult. Even if we were to give them adequate salaries now, the kind of salaries that would allow them to live like well-respected civil servants, but not like uh, millionaires, they would not be satisfied with it because they've got used to a different way of life. So it's not just re-education in the technical sense. It's re-education with, uh, with regard to attitudes and mindset. How do we persuade these people who have got used to a very opulent way of life that they can make do with a more modest standard of living but lead clean lives that will gain them the respect of society. It's very difficult. So their rule of law comes in again. Action will have to be taken. It's not enough simply to say, we're now paying you a decent salary. You live within its means. There will have to be laws that will enable us to take action against civil servants and against judges who are corrupt. So rule of law will engender rule of law. We have to start by imposing rule of law on the judiciary itself. That is not going to be an easy task. We need help with this judicial reforms. Our committee has started by investigating three uh, courts of justice, just to find out what the actual practices are. What do the judges do? How does the government attorney behave? And what kind of justice do uh, those who come for justice expect? These practical measures we are taking, that we may make practical recommendations to the various departments concerned, the Home Ministry, the Defense Ministry, the Attorney General's Office, the Information Ministry. All of these will have to be involved in our efforts to re-establish rule of law in Burma. If we manage to do this, this would be a tremendous breakthrough for our country. Once we can say that we have been able to re-establish rule of law, then we can say that the process of democratization has succeeded. Until that point, I do not think we can say that the process of democratization has succeeded. It is not enough just to simply make laws, which we are doing in the legislature. We have to make sure that these laws are just, and not only just, but that these laws are implemented in the right way. There must be due process as well as just laws. So until we can do that, we cannot say that democracy is on a safe road. People ask me, have we reached the point when democracy has become, uh, d that democratization has become irreversible? And I say no. No, because to begin with, the Constitution is in the way. The Constitution allows the military extraordinary powers. And as long as the military possesses these powers, we cannot say 
that we are on the true road to democracy. Which is why we have linked these three, rule of law, end to ethnic conflict, and amendments to the constitutions. These are all linked. If democracy is to be restored to our country, we must have all three. Without one, the other two will fail too. We can't have rule of law and not have amendments to the constitution and an end to ethnic conflict. And we cannot achieve the other two without rule of law. So because of these links, we put the greatest importance on the reestablishment of rule of law. It will mean on a practical basis that our people can be safer, more secure within the laws of the land. I am sure I do not have to explain to law students that rule of law is not the same as rule by law, and that laws alone are not enough. They have to be just laws. So Burma is now at the beginning of a path. And I, I keep repeating that this is going to be the most difficult road we have to travel. Too many people think that there has been a breakthrough. I don't think we can say there has been a breakthrough. We have been given the opportunity to achieve a, a breakthrough. Uh, this morning, uh, there was the word achieve used a uh, few times. And I made the point that we have yet to achieve. We have not yet achieved, but we have been given the opportunity to achieve. And in this process, we need help from different directions. And I would like to take this opportunity to ask for your help and support with regard to the establishment of rule of law in Burma. We need well-trained lawyers. We need well-trained judges. We need a good law school at our, at our good law schools in our universities. We need contact between the members of our judiciary and the members of the judiciaries of practicing democracies. There is so much that we need. We need broad education with regard to rights as well as responsibilities. People are very keen on democratic rights but they do not always want to know about responsibilities. But if we want rule of law in Burma, we must put equal emphasis on both, rights as well as responsibilities. Citizens who expect the protection of the law must themselves respect the law. If we are to achieve all this, then I think we can be confident that Burma will be firmly on the road to democracy. For years, we have suffered from lack of rule of law, which means that we can never be sure what is going to happen to us next. And this is a fact in Burma. For many years, we would have to ask every day who was arrested the, the night before, because arrests were usually made in the middle of the night. And uh, we had to find out in the morning which of our colleagues were still free and which had been uh, and which of them had been put into prison during the night or taken away to the police station. And often, we would never know where they had been taken. In 1998, we formed the committee representing the People's Parliament. That is to say, this committee was supposed to be a committee representing those who had been elected in the 1990 elections, which were ignored by the military because we won too well. And because we declared that they, we would be forming this committee, many, many of our elected representatives were taken away into custody. They were told that uh, the authorities wanted to discuss the convening of parliament with them. But in fact, they were simply taken away to military contournments, to uh, police uh, stations, and kept there for weeks without contact with their families. They were not charged under any section of the law. They were just kept there week after week after week. Then they were allowed to come back home. Uh, I, I don't quite know why they allowed them to come back home. Every couple of weeks they would be allowed to go back home and then they would be taken back, back again into custody. And this went on for more than a year. 
And this was how it was in Burma. If you have anything to do with politics, your life is never secure. They can take action against you in any way they please. My own experience at Dipeyin. Dipeyin was 2003 when I was campaigning in northern Burma. And as uh, the, the, the campaign proceeded, the support of the public became stronger and stronger. And one evening, while I was traveling from one place to another, uh, our car was stopped. It was stopped by a monk who said that he wanted uh, me to give a speech. It, dusk was coming on, and we had been warned that there might be problems. So we said no, it was too late, and there were no arrangements for me to speak at that particular place, so we would have to go on. But he kept on trying to persuade us to stop for a bit. And then somebody came running up from the back of our uh, motorcade and said that troops of thugs had arrived and they were beating up our people uh, at, the, uh, at the back. Uh, this was what the Dipeyan incident was about. Some of those thugs were dressed as monks, but they were obviously not monks because they all had white handkerchiefs tied to one arm. I think this was to indicate that they belonged to the same group. And they had enormous staffs. Uh, they killed four of our people. They just beat them to death. And they also beat in the windows of my car. Uh, but I had a very good driver. Uh, we, I did not go on because I felt that I had to wait for the others and I couldn't just leave them to be beaten up. Then the young man who was driving my car said, look, they're putting barriers up across the road in front of us. And I saw that and he said, I think they're trying to cut us off from our people who are coming from the other direction. Shall I drive through the barrier? So I said, yes, drive through the barrier so we can meet up. Well, what did you, what did you expect me to do? <laughs> uh, and it, was, it was very exciting. I had never been in a car that leapt over a barrier before. <laughs> but when we got to the other side, we found that there was nobody there. They were just trying to cut us off uh, from, from, from all the roads around us. And I don't know what the intention was, whether it was just to beat all of us up or to arrest all of us. But when we got over the barrier, uh, we found nothing. And we kept going and going and going until we got to the next town when we were arrested. Now, the point is that we were the ones who were beaten up, but we were put in prison as destructive elements. So this was a great mystery to us. What had we done uh, to, to deserve this imprisonment? We hadn't raised a finger. Uh, yet, that was the reason why I was placed under, uh, under house arrest for the next six years, which stretched to seven years, because there was the episode of the American who came swimming to my house, <laughs> bringing greetings from all of you, no doubt. <laughs> but uh, so I was kept under house arrest for seven years. The last year and a half that I was kept under house arrest on the grounds that uh, I had not turned uh, the visitor over to the police. I had not turned him over the, to the police because I did not believe that he would receive justice from them. We had never received justice from the authorities, and I thought that it would be immoral of me to turn over somebody to the security forces when I knew that he would not be given justice. Mind you, I shouldn't have worried so much about him because since he was not Burmese, he was let go pretty soon. But I was, of course, kept on for another 18 months beyond the time when I should have been released. This, I think, was basically to keep me under house arrest while the elections of 2010 were conducted. So the law can be used in any way that the authorities please to promote their own political agenda. And that is certainly not the rule of law. Because of that, we are working very hard in the legislature to re-establish rule of law and to make sure that it goes hand in hand with other democratic reforms. If there are no substantial reforms to the judiciary, we cannot believe that this is a true process of democratization. And I hope this is something that, that you will keep in mind 
that you will watch what is going on in Burma and be aware of the fact that we have, that our judiciary at the moment is, moment is practically non-existent. And until we have a strong, independent, clean judiciary, uh, we cannot say that Burma is truly on the road to democracy. I'm saying this because people have asked me when they can assume that Burma has reached the point when the process is irreversible. And I always say there's no such thing as an irreversible process because we were a practicing, pra practicing democracy when the army took over in 1962. So there is never a point where we can say this is irreversible, but there must come a point when everybody recognizes it that to reverse the process will be far more painful than to continue along that. Thank you. I keep, with, I keep within the 40 minutes. Well, thank you so much for those remarks and uh, for those reflections on trying to build the rule of law in Burma. Now, we've asked people to submit cards, and I, I got dozens of wonderful questions, and many of them very much pertinent to the subject that you were talking about. So I, with, I hope you'll excuse me if I don't read your question. Uh, we, there were many. Uh, duplicative questions, um, and so I'll do, the, I'll do the best I can to try to synthesize the spirit of what, of what came forward from the floor. But a good, I thought inter, one of the interesting questions about rule of law, and it particularly seems appropriate given the difficulty of making this transition from a corrupt, essentially lawless, well, paper laws, but laws that are either oppressive or not enforced, um, how to make that transition to the kind of regime you envision. Many the, the question is that many countries around the world in th the last couple of decades have experienced transitions from having um, uh, oppressive non-democratic regimes to greater democracy. Do you see any examples in Eastern Europe or Latin America or any other parts of the world that have gone through a transition um, uh, th that, that seem relevant or useful to you in thinking about how to affect the transition in Burma? Well, I know of some examples which uh, tell us what we must not do. Uh, I was speaking to some uh, politicians from Cambodia recently, and they remarked that uh, the, the fact that we put so much emphasis on the rule of law was a good thing. They said they had neglected to do that in Cambodia. They had emphasized the need for free elections and a free legislature, but omitted the importance of rule of law. And they ha said that because of that, Cambodia is now having problems with uh, taking forward the process of democratization. So this is, an, if you like, a negative lesson we've learned, what can happen without the rule of law. But I think in other transitions, such as in Indonesia and in South Africa, they have tried to strengthen rule of law as the democratization process went forward. I think in, in, in South Africa, perhaps they had an easier job than we are going to have in Burma, because although there was apartheid, which was, which was ruled by law, rather than rule of law. At least there were, there were working judiciaries, which I don't think we can say of in Burma. So we'll have to start from scratch. We are in a far weaker position than many of the countries which have made the transition to democracy when it comes to the judiciary. One, one interesting question asks about the judiciary and interestingly raises a number of the things you, questions you did attempt to address, like, and the question is, what are the major problems, and how 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 would you, uh, in a sense, rank them? Corruption of the judiciary, the lack of courage in enforcing laws against states, the competence of judges, the the uh, 
res respect for the judiciary by the people and the political will for reform. And it did seem to me you but touched all on those, that, but in a way you Plus, of course, uh, the Home Department, that is to say, the police. We need a clean police. We need the, the, the people who enforce these laws to be, uh, to be able to live within those laws. This is why we are cooperating with the Home Ministry as well as the Defense Ministry in trying to reestablish rule of law in Burma. We cannot just deal with the Attorney General's office. We can't just deal with the courts. We have to make sure that our police too are clean and capable of carrying out the process of rule of law. It seems to me it takes a kind of political will on the part not only of the populace but of the of these people who are, whose lives were used to a corrupt regime who have to transform their ways. Yes, uh, it's very difficult to make people uncorrupt, as it were. As I said, they get used to a certain way of living, a certain standard of living, and it would be difficult to convince them that they should take less. But on the other hand, of course, we can always recruit new members as well. There's, there's several questions here. You talked about the, the how the, question of the rights of ethnic minorities interweaves with, with the question of human rights in Burma. Um, you want to comment a little more, in a little more depth on that? I mean, what, what is the status of ethnic minorities in Burma now? And what, in the transition toward democracy, how do you see those interests being a, a, properly represented? The great majority of the ethnic nationalities live in the border areas. And as always happens, they can, more injustices are committed the further away you move from the center of government. This, is, this happens everywhere. And uh, the, our people, they are poorer, they have less access to justice, uh, they have less access to organizations that might be able to help them. So unless we can make our ethnic nationalities feel that they are on an even footing with the majority Burmese, we will never be able to achieve genuine harmony in the country. The, I, one of the requests that I always make to people who want to invest in Burma, whether in development or in humanitarian efforts or in economic, uh, economic uh, enterprises, I ask them to try to work as far as possible in the ethnic nationality areas, not just to concentrate uh, in that area, in the center, central part of Burma where the Burmese live, but in the outlying areas to bring up the standard of living of our uh, ethnic nationality states to that of the central area of Burma. And this would help if there were more, uh, if our nation ethnic nationality areas had more access to the wider world, there would be fewer injustices committed. At least they could not commit this injustices and get away with them to that extent. But the connection of ethnic minorities and religious uh, identity, th th there's, there are many religions practiced in Burma, yeah. although the majority are Buddhist, and, and you obviously yourself have written about the importance of Buddhist teachings and practice in your own thinking, in your own life. Is, 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 um, are, are there, uh, how would you, uh, what role is there for uh, better understanding across the religious boundaries? Is that a means to reducing the ethnic, um, inter-ethnic conflicts? Some of our ethnic nationalities uh, practice uh, religions other than Buddhism. For example, in the Kachin state, the Baptist church as well as the Roman Catholic church are very strong, particularly the Baptist church. And in the Chin state as well, uh, Christianity is, is the dominant religion. And I have to say with great sadness that uh, there have been uh, violations against their right to worship freely, particularly in the Chin, Chin state. Our Chin friends have complained that uh, pressure has been put on them to uh, not to give up their religion, but, but to practice their religion less ostentatiously. Uh, the, the Chins used to, I thought it was a beautiful custom they used to put up crucifixes on, uh, on hilltops. I, I think this is beautiful because this is their religion. They worship it, and it's lovely to see them from a distance. But at one time, there was a campaign to get rid of all these crucifixes. Uh, 
campaign conducted <coughs> by Buddhists. And I'm very sorry that th this happened. I do not think that this kind of action should be allowed at all. And uh, the, in the Kachin state, we have found that the Christian churches do very good work with regard to the internally displaced people uh, who have been herded into camps because of the conflict that took place over the last year. We can get help to them best through the Christian churches. So a lot of uh, cooperative effort is possible, mm. and this will not only bring about better understanding between the different religious groups and ethnic groups, I think it will also bring more practical help to our ethnic nationalities. Mm. Buddhist monks played a significant role in, in 2007 in the Saffron Revolution. Is, are, are, is there uh, any prospect of, of that, of, you know, of using clergy, clergy, clergy and clergymen to uh, help cross those lines? I mean, to, uh, to give you an example, Tony Blair taught a course here for three years on faith and globalization in which the real focus was, was actually drew from his experience in Northern Ireland where he's getting a peaceful solution in Northern Ireland was uh, in large part because of his ability to work with both Protestant and Catholic clergy to help bridge some of the divide. I wonder, is, is that a strategy that could help with reducing ethnic tensions? I think, so. I think there are a number of Buddhist monks and uh, Christian clergymen who are working right. towards right. Uh, such a uh, resolution of uh, conflicts between their communities. And what, what about the role of Muslim populations in, in? The Muslim populations are scattered all over Burma, but of course these days people hear most about the Muslim population in the Rakhine state because of the recent troubles. Right. And there the communal problems ha go back a long way. And I have to say quite frankly that these are not going to be resolved overnight. Uh, this is another reason why I emphasize rule of law, because rule of law can help to ease tensions. They will not make the communal problems go away. The communal differences cannot be made to vanish overnight. It takes a long time. It takes understanding on both sides. It, it takes positive action from both sides. I'm not saying it's impossible. I believe it is possible because uh, there are Muslims in the Rakhine state who have lived there for generations and at peace with their Buddhist neighbors. So I do not see why this kind of peaceful, harmonious relationship should not be reestablished, especially now, as the government is saying, that they will respect the citizenship laws. Mm -hmm. I think we should go also go a step forward and review the citizenship laws to make sure that they're in keeping with international standards. Mm -hmm. Coming back to sort of the constitutional framework, which you talked about a bit, um, another question asks, um, given that the current constitution provides for sort of reserved percentages of representation in parliament for the military, is, do you see that as a hindrance to uh, an evolution toward rule of law or democracy? Well, of course, uh, in, in a genuine democracy, you can't have an unelected portion of the legislature which votes on an equal footing with uh, those who are elected. But I have to say that I really, at the moment, don't mind having the, uh, the military contingent there because that's our best opportunity to get to know them. <laughs> uh, I, I, it, it's the truth. And I think uh, once they get to know us, they will understand that we're not against them. We want to work together with them to build up the kind of society that would be good for them as well as for us. I've, I've never had so much dealings with military men in my life until I entered the legislature. I have a couple of questions that, go, that, that uh, really go to the issue of universality versus um, local variation. So one question is about democratic institutions. I mean, do you see democratic principles as entirely universal at, at, or, or, or is, is there room or would it be appropriate to have significant local variation? And similar question with respect to human rights. Are, are, are human rights strictly universal or do values and beliefs in different societies warrant a somewhat different framework for human rights? I believe in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights right. and I believe human rights should be universal. But uh, with regard to democracy, I think there will be local variations. There will be regional, national variations. That cannot be avoided. But that does not mean I accept uh, the kind of definition of democracy, 
which the military regime adopted. Uh, I think they called it disciplined democracy. I, I think that simply <laughs> means that. Uh, means disciplined Demo democracy. Uh, yes. <laughs> and in fact, uh, I am rather concerned that some people still think of the transition towards democracy as a transition towards disciplined democracy. That is to say, democracy as acceptable to the military. So one area of, in, the, in the realm of human rights in which there is actually quite a bit of variation across democracies is free speech, where in this country, for example, um, speech is protected even if it is blasphemous uh, or, or, or criticizes another, another person's religion. But in many societies, that kind of speech even though there's general freedom of expression, that, that, that kind of speech is not tolerated. Where, 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 how do you see that? Under, the, out in Burma? under the Burmese constitution, you are not supposed to attack others' religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that um, I think attacking others' religious beliefs is not an, a necessary element in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You should be free to practice your own religion. But sir, surely you should respect other people's religions as well if those religions do not impinge on your own freedom. I would never insult another's religion. I would never say anything disrespectful of religions that are not my own. Because I think that in many ways that's an abuse of my right to freedom of speech. You should not use your own freedoms to hurt others, or to restrict others' freedoms, or to offend others. If you do not like what somebody else is doing, because it in some way infringes on your own way of life, then you can talk it over. Why can't we have reasonable dialogue with regard to our differences? Why do we need to insult others because they do not believe the, in the way in which we believe. Yeah. Um, one more aspect of rule of law is, has to do with, the role, with what can the external world do to help the advance of rule and law in, in, in Burma. And there are actually three different questions, but all pretty much the same, well, pointing in the same direction. What can the international community to do to promote the development of democracy and rule of law? What can the United Nations do? And what can US foreign policy do? Uh, so you're people thinking along similar lines. Do you, um, do you want to comment on where, where can the outside world be of help? Well, the international community needs to be aware of the fact that we need rule of law if we are really to progress towards democracy. I don't want them to ignore the needs of our judiciary. I think there's too much concentration now on the economic side of uh, changes in my country and on the political side, but it seems mainly on the economic side. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to be a little careful of that. Uh, as I said this morning, uh, development is no substitute for democracy. And economic development is certainly not, no substitute for a weak judiciary. So awareness is the first way in which the international community can help us. With regard to the United Nations and the United States, they could help us in practical uh, ways with the training of lawyers, with the training of judges, with, uh, I want to set up internships to help our committee for the rule of law and tranquility. So with the establishment of such internships, there are many practical ways in which they can help, one, our committee, and uh, through the committee, the reestablishment of rule of law in our country. Well, one of the things the president of Yale can't do is commit the Yale Law School to any particular course of action. <laughs> but, but I will have a conversation with our dean to see if there's anything that we can do to be helpful on, on those lines. Um, one last political question, then turn to a couple of personal questions to close. Um, so why did they let you out? And why, and why is this transition toward democracy taking place? What was in the minds of the leaders that allowed this to happen? Well, we've been discussing this quite a lot. And uh, we tend to forget the 2008 Constitution. I think the 2008 Constitution was aimed at change. Uh, 
the constitution assures the military an influential position in the governance of this country. And since that constitution was adopted in 2008, I think the military regime felt that it was time to go forward and to institute the kind of changes which would bring positive benefits to the country. There was no doubt about it that our country had got poorer and poorer under successive military governments and that our people were getting more and more discontented. So this is all part of a program which I believe was decided on some time back. And 2010, when the elections were held to turn the military uh, government into a civilian one, that is to say, uh, the, the military mem members of the government uh, retired from the military and contested the uh, elections as civilians and became the members of this new civilian government. I think most of you know that the ma majority of the members of our government now are ex-military people, the same people who were in government before 2010. But among them are those who wish to bring about genuine reform because they know that the country cannot go on in this way from, from economic crisis to economic crisis, from social crisis to social crisis. And also, I think, reform tends to take on its own momentum. And this is what we have to take advantage of. For whatever reason, reforms may have been started. We have to make sure that they are continued in the right way and that we all help to keep it on the right path. So uh, no fewer than eight or 10 students, I think, wrote, asked, asked a version of the, same, of the following question that's more personal. What kept you going through those years of house arrest? And what, what, what kept you focused? What, what would you, one, one form of the question was, what advice would you give yourself now if you could turn the clock back to 1988 about how to endure that hardship? Or another version of the question is, what advice would you give to others who are, are facing a similar well, um, what advice I would give myself if I could turn the clock back mm -hmm. is that I would have listened much more, I would have been a better pupil of my music teacher. Because <laughs> re re really, I, I really regretted the hours I wasted when I should have been practic practicing my scales and exercises. Because I thought if I had really studied music very, very well, it would have been a great solace to me throughout the years of house arrest. There were other things I could do. I enjoy reading, I had books, I listened to the radio, but I would very much like to have been able to play the piano really well throughout this year. <laughs> inner resources, that is what is important. What you need are inner resources to keep you going under, under all circumstances. And these inner resor resources you acquire throughout, uh, your, throughout your life not just during the years you are at school, but throughout your life. And I would say to young people, try to strengthen yourself internally. Don't depend too much on external factors. You must be able to live with yourself. I never found it difficult to be alone. There were so many things I could do. Well, if there was nothing else, I could always think. And you have to learn to do that. And also, we have a saying in, in Burmese, what is important for you is not just to be able to, uh, to, what is the word, to suffer the hardships of bad fortune, but you also have to know how to suffer the hardships of good fortune. Do you understand what that means? <laughs> that means that you must not be shaken by external circumstances. You must not be... Uh, tempted away from the path that you've set yourself by the hope of gain, by the hope of comfort, uh, that you should not let yourself be corrupted. To be corrupted is to give in to the hardships of good fortune, and you cannot resist the temptations of good fortune. To be unable to stand up to hardship is, of course, not to be able to resist the hardships of bad fortune. So you have to be able to do for both. You have to be able to detach yourself from the immediate circumstances 
and think of the greater picture. You must have an idea of the sort of person you want to be. Unless you have such an idea, you will not be able to hold true to any one path in life. Every one of us, especially the young, must have an idea of the kind of person he or she would like to be. I was fortunate in that very early on, I knew what kind of person I wanted to be. This was linked to my parents. I knew what kind of person they would have wished me to be. Now, of course, it's, uh, in this day and age, people will think this is, it's very old-fashioned to want to comply with the wishes of one's parents. But sometimes it's worth a try. <laughs> You know, I, I had another question, which I think you just answered, which is what, would, you know, what advice would you give to our students here today as they face their opportunities to lead and change the world? And I think you've just done that. And so I'm going to say thank you so much for inspiring us, for being here with us. And <laughs>